and I'm wondering if uh, any objections to me going over 12 o'clock. If you do object to that, you've got about eight minutes to make up your mind because it's about eight minutes to 12. So we're going to go a little bit longer than that, but I won't keep you too long. And uh, if you need to leave by then, I won't be offended. Let's uh, take uh, our Bibles and uh, look in the uh, Gospel of Luke in the New Testament, Luke chapter 14. And uh, this is a, a well-known uh, parable that Jesus told. And uh, uh, of course, most of you like a title for the sermon because for some of you, that's the only thing you'll remember about the sermon in the next week anyhow. And so I've entitled it, 10 Good Reasons Why You Should Not Join the Church. Let's have a look at our text. We're in Luke chapter 14, verse 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is him that's, uh, that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, a certain man made a great supper and invited many people. He sent his servants at supper time to say to them uh, that were invited, Come, for everything is now ready. I'm reading the, reading the Kenneth John Curtis version of the King James version, so you'll see it a little different perhaps. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuses. The first said to him, I bought a piece of land and I must go and see it. Land doesn't seem to disappear all that quickly except in Christchurch. I beg you to let me be excused. Another one said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to test them out. I pray, let me be excused. Today we would say, I bought a new tractor, a John Deere, and I better make sure that it's still in the shed and it's still going okay to make sure the warranty is still okay on it. So let me be excused. I will not be at your, <coughs> at your feast. Another said, I've married a wife, so I can't come. Well, wives can be a little bit uh, restrictive sometimes, can't they? Because uh, she's possibly got a hair appointment or something like that that she can't let go because she's going to go to something else in a day or two's time and she's got to look just fine. In any case, she doesn't like going to the kind of feast that this guy likes to go to, so please excuse me. So the servant came and showed his master all these things and the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in everyone, the poor, the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, It's done just as you commanded, and there's yet plenty of room. So the Lord said to his servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and <coughs> compel them, urge them to come in, so that my house can be filled with people. For I say to you that none of those men who were invited to the feast will taste a bit of my supper. Well, we read this parable as the parable of excuses, don't we? The parable of excuses. Jesus suggests that uh, the feast that he's talking about here is not just a typical feast. It's just not an ordinary kind of birthday party. It's not an ordinary kind of 21st or a wedding feast because uh, someone has uh, prompted Jesus to tell the story as we read in verse 15. And when one of them that sat at the table and meet with him, it says in my translation, but uh, sat at the meal with him, when he heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus was prompted to say something in this parable that has to do with the kind of feast that can be one day enjoyed in the kingdom of God. Jesus wasn't talking about an ordinary uh, bit of kai somewhere where we would have uh, a snack, so to speak, and go about our daily work again for the rest of the day. He was talking 
about something far more significant than that. He was talking about what it will be like to be able to eat the supper that the Lord is preparing for us in heaven as we commence our eternal life. There are so many excuses that people make for not accepting the invitation <coughs> to the Lord's great supper. And I've listed 10 of them, so I'll have to go through them fairly quickly. And these are excuses that I have had offered to me in the course of my ministry by various people. And uh, they have uh, all of these, and I, I suppose I could add quite a few more. These are the most significant 10 excuses that people have offered, and they all seem to be good excuses. Well, you'll judge that as we go along. Number one, there's too many hypocrites in the church, and that's why I don't want to belong to the church. There's too many hypocrites there. Well, what's the answer to that? <clears throat> Let's have a look in Matthew 7, and we won't look up all the references I've got here because time won't permit, but go to Matthew chapter 7 and uh, verse uh, 21. Matthew 7 and verse 21. If you don't want to turn there, I'll just read it out to you. Not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, and in your name have cast out devils, and in the name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. Jesus is talking about hypocrites. Where do you find hypocrites? Well, of course, you're going to say you find hypocrites in the church. But I say you find hypocrites everywhere. And so when people say there's too many hypocrites in the church, they're right, aren't they? That's a pretty good excuse. There's hypocrites in the church. And if you don't want to be associated with hypocrites, you better keep out of the church. But of course, when you step outside of the church, you step into a bunch of hypocrites. More hypocrites outside the church than inside the church, by far. You find hypocrites in the motor trade. You find hypocrites, apparently, in the grocery trade, as we've heard recently. You find hypocrites in the real estate business. You find hypocrites everywhere. And so if you want to avoid hypocrites, you better get out of the world. And you can't get out of the world without employing hypocrites. So you've got some problems, haven't you? It's not such a good excuse after all. If you want to get away from hypocrites, there's only one way of doing it, and that's committing suicide, and then you become the world's greatest hypocrite anyhow. So that's not a very good excuse, but that's what people tell me. I don't want to be in the church because there's hypocrites there. I tell you, if you find a church without a hypocrite in it, let me know, and I'll join that church. Then, of course, they might discover they've got a hypocrite in their church. So <laughs> not a good excuse, is it? Number two, I don't feel as though I'm ready to commit to a church. I don't feel as though I'm ready to commit to a church. Do you know that nobody naturally feels that they should commit themselves to God? But it's strange that people always commit themselves to something. Everybody is committed in some way to something. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, there is something that everyone who's ever lived has committed themselves to. You say, well, this word commit makes it sound like marriage. And, uh, well, that's true. But it's not just marriage. There's many other things that people commit themselves in and to, and uh, they are dedicated to that uh, philosophy or to that activity. And uh, so why can't they commit themselves to the church? If they say, I feel as though I can't commit myself, I, I don't feel uh, that I can commit myself to the church, it means that they don't feel that they can make a commitment of any real significant nature in any other thing. And yet they do make these commitments. And I say to these people, I say, you make other commitments which you intend to hold to. Why do you think you can't make a commitment to the church and join the church? 
And uh, of course, they come up with these peripheral arguments and so on, but feeling is not the way to go. You don't always feel all that religious, do you? Even those of you who have been religious for many, many, many years, as I have been, I don't always feel like being excessively religious. Feelings are not a good way to go because we are fallen, sinful human beings and our feelings can fluctuate up and down and around about and uh, our feelings are not a good guide. We need to go on what the Lord says. And the Lord says, commit yourselves uh, <coughs> to me and my church and uh, you will be blessed. We all commit to something. It's not such a good excuse after all. Number three, I don't think the church spends my tithe money wisely. How often have I heard that excuse? I've heard that excuse from people who are contemplating joining the church and I've heard it from people who are already in the church. I don't believe I can commit myself to the church because I don't think the people in charge are spending my tithe money wisely. Not a bad excuse. You like to see your money spent well, don't you? When you invest your money in something, you like to see your money being productive, doing something, giving you a return. But I'm going to tell you this is not such a good excuse after all because the tithe money that you give to the church is not yours in the first place. You are only entrusted with it. You are entrusted with it to uh, send it on to the appropriate place where it is distributed and where you may be able to say, I have a part in the work of the church away over there in some other part of the world, another town, another city, somewhere where I can't be, where my influence cannot tell, but I have a part in it because I have contributed the tithe that the Lord has entrusted to me and we are entrusted with the work of taking the gospel to the world. And so the tithe that you are given is not yours. You know, when, uh, <coughs> when uh, Moses was uh, talking to the people and, and talking to them about uh, tithe, he says, one-tenth you shall give of uh, what you have, one-tenth of your increase you shall give. But uh, then you come to the last book of the Old Testament and it talks about the tithe there and it says that without giving the tithe you are robbing God. So if you are robbing God you are taking something that belongs to God and not to myself or not to you. And so if you think that your tithe is not spent wisely it's God's tithe and it's his concern as to how it's spent. So I don't think that's a terribly good excuse. <coughs> Number four, I can't keep up with the church standards like these other church people seem to be able to do. You know, this sounds like a very good excuse. I've had people say to me, I couldn't be one of your church members because they're all too good. I remember studying with a fellow who was a pretty tough character in his day. He came from a pretty tough background. And he says, uh, I couldn't be part of your church because they're all too good. And I thought to myself, but I didn't tell him, yeah, I know my church members. It was a particular church that we had. And I know these church members. And if you knew what I know about these church members, you wouldn't say that these church members were all too good. Because I suppose I was there to help them to get better. And I hope that they were better in the time that I was there. And I think they, they are better. And... Uh, <coughs> If we start analysing people, we will find that they're all not too good. And uh, if we start considering ourselves unable to be part of the church because other people are too good for us, then I'm afraid we have uh, made a very poor excuse. You know uh, that uh, if you fly with the ducks, you get shot down with the ducks. Isn't that the old saying? You fly with the ducks and you get shot down with the ducks. And so if you want to be out there in the world and you don't want to be in the church, you would get shot down out there in the world. Wouldn't it be better to be in the church where maybe they're not all so perfect, but at least they're going to protect you and you're not going to get shot down. Number five, and this one is quite a serious one. I will have to change my occupation 
if I join the church. This is an excuse I've heard many times, mostly comes from people in their 20s and 30s. <clears throat> you don't hear it much when they're young, you don't hear it when they're older, um, <clears throat> but uh, using their 20s and 30s. I'll have to change my occupation if I join the church. Let's go to the ch uh, book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, <clears throat> we want uh, chapter, chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and reverse uh, 31 and uh, 32. Luke 12, chapter th uh, verse 31 and 32. And Jesus says, But rather seek the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. <clears throat> Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure that is in heaven that fails not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupts. It sounds like a good excuse because our work is often our security in this life. And it's very difficult, perhaps in this day and age, and particularly this particular time in the economic recession, <coughs> and uh, that's very difficult to contemplate changing jobs. Young people don't seem to be so worried. I know a lot of young people quit one job and they go hunting for another and they find something else and so on. But when you've got a profession that conflicts with the principles of the church, it's a very hard thing for people to give up the security that they have in their job. But is it an adequate excuse? Jesus said it's not. Jesus said, all these things I will give to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything else will fall into place. So I think that it's probably not an adequate excuse. I remember studying a couple of times with a fellow who had a racehorse stud, lived near Cambridge. And uh, he very, very nearly joined the church. He had no background of spiritual stuff at all. Someone else had been working with him, but I called a couple of times, I think it was, and saw him. He had this uh, horse stud, and I had somewhat to do with a little church that was in uh, Tiamutu. And uh, he very, very nearly joined the church. But he said, uh, if I join the church, I'll have to give up breeding racehorses. And I said, well, why would you give up breeding racehorses? He says, because racehorses only exist because of the betting industry, the racing industry. It's a form of gambling. Well, I already knew that. And I led him on a little bit to talk about it, and he told me a little bit of stuff, he and uh, this other uh, younger minister. And uh, <coughs> we talked about it a bit, and uh, he was convinced that if he joined the church, the racing industry would suffer a severe loss because he wouldn't be breeding their racehorses anymore. And he rationalised it around and around, thinking he was making a good contribution to society by providing them with racehorses. I would love to have followed up his racehorse career and his racehorses to see if they ever made a big win. But as far as I know, they've never won the Melbourne Cup. And I guess by now, any racehorses he had then would be dead and turned into cat food long ago. You see, Jesus has something far better than racehorses. Far, far better than racehorses. He will care for our occupation. I could tell you stories of people who have joined the church and changed their occupation and have been greatly blessed. I can tell you other stories where people have joined the church and uh, change their occupation and things have gone pretty hard for them. But they have something of more, more value than the dollars and cents and security that they had in their job. Number six, my family will reject me if I join the church. This is serious stuff, isn't it? You know, when we read the New Testament and we look at the relationship between Jesus and his family, it always appears as though it's pretty strained, even sometimes with his mother and father. You ever thought of that? 
His relationship with his family seems most times to be rather strained. His brothers are trying to stop him to go out to preach. And his brothers are trying to stop him to go going to Jerusalem. It seems as though his, uh, his mother is a little bit bossy at times. Um, whatever mum says, Jesus has to do. It uh, seems as though he just has to be in that position because he's the church. Jesus is really the head of the church, even though he's only a child. And he's about 12 years old and he's at the temple and he's talking and discussing spiritual things and he's discussing from the perspective of what his life will be and what he is as the Messiah and as the saviour of the world and he's discussing these things with the teachers of the, uh, the church in those days and his mother and father are uh, annoyed because he stayed behind and uh, they're two days on the way home again and they've got to go back again and they give him a little bit of a growling of course, we don't have all the detail of what went on, but when people are upset, uh, you know, they, uh, they can express themselves adequately enough to show that they're annoyed. And uh, Jesus' relationship with his family does seem to be a little strained at times. But Jesus says, maybe you'll have to give up father and mother and brother and sister, and maybe it'll be uncles and aunts and in some unfortunate cases it can even be spouses in order to serve me. In order to serve me and to gain the kingdom of heaven, it may be that there will be strained relationships. But relationships last for an hour. They last for a day, a week, a month, a year, a lifetime, maybe of 50, 60, 70, 80, or if they live long enough, 80 or 95 years or a hundred years, but eternity goes on forever. A relationship with God that lasts forever must surely be better than any strained relationship that we might have in this world. Not a very good excuse. Number seven, just very briefly, I'm too old to do something new. I say that sometimes. I think I'm too old to shift house, actually, and I'm shifting the stuff tomorrow into, uh, into storage because we've sold the house and we've got to be out on the 26th and uh, we haven't decided what we're going to buy or whatever. And uh, I'm too old to do this, but I've got to do it. I'm too old. But I've committed myself to someone. I've said, you can buy my house, and uh, they have bought my house, and so I'm committed and I'm too old to be shifting house, I think, at 71. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a real hassle to shift house, but I'm committed. I'm going to shift this stuff tomorrow somehow or another. Uh, boy's coming to give me a hand. That'll be good. Don't have to do it all tomorrow. But uh, <coughs> is that a good excuse when it comes to joining the church? I'm too old to make the change. I'm too old to get out of my old habits, my old lethargic spiritual ways even. I'm too old to be revived and to join the church. Not a good excuse. You know that some of the people that Jesus uh, dealt with in his time and uh, in the uh, story relating to Jesus' life on earth were actually very aged. What about Zechariah and Elizabeth? Very old people involved in Jesus' ministry there and they had to make some significant changes Apparently, they were in their 70s. That's a good age to be. They may have been a little older, and they had to bring up a child in their 70s. That means in those days, you would be looking after that child till they were 20, which means that they would have been 90 years old, anticipate being 90 or so, and they still have a child at home. And uh, that child, of course, was John the Baptist, and he went out uh, independently somewhere around about that age. So, is it a good excuse? Number eight, <clears throat> I can be a good Christian without a church. God knows my heart anyway. I've had people say this to me. My own brother-in-law said this to me. He said, I can be a good Christian without a church. And uh, <clears throat> I said to him, well, what do you do if you don't have a, if you don't have a church? Uh, where do you have your spiritual support? I don't need any, he says. I don't need any. And they said, I can live my life on my own spiritually as well. 
But you know, when you go into the New Testament, you discover that as the apostles went out to preach about Jesus and his saving power and his will to save people and his uh, activity to save people, the apostles took these people to the church. And thousands joined the church at a time. And whenever the apostles went out to preach, as the book of Acts records, perhaps the first almost 100 years of Christianity, people were led to the church. I'm reminded of a little statement that I read in, uh, in a book, I think it's called Gospel... Uh, um, it's, it's one by Ellen White, and she says, the church is the place where God deposits the jewels for his kingdom. Where else would you want to be but in the church where the jewels of God's kingdom are deposited? And so today, sitting in this church, there are jewels for God's kingdom. And the jewels for God's kingdom are found in the church. They're found out there in the world in the rough, but when they come to the church, they become jewels. The other day, I was in an antique shop, and uh, I saw there a, uh, a, a, a rough-looking stone. It was a really rough looking bit of stuff and then I walked around to the other side of it and uh, it was full of those uh, purple crystals. What do you call them? Um, amethyst. Amethyst. Stone about that big with the end cut off it and these beautiful purple amethyst crystals inside of it. And I guess somebody walked over that stone hundreds of times, tripped over it perhaps in a creek somewhere, possibly in South America, and uh, never knew what was inside of it. Somebody else saw it and uh, cut it open and inside were these beautiful amethysts. I've seen a, a stone about that high uh, cut in half. Years ago I saw this and in the uh, amethyst crystals were, were huge, big as my thumb or bigger. And uh, inside of there was the jewel. There's jewels out in the world but it's the church that produces the visible jewel and uh, it is where God's jewel box is. Not a good excuse to say that uh, you can't uh, be a, a Christian because you don't want to join the church. Number nine, when I've done all the things I want to do, then I'll join the church. This is the young people's one. When I've done everything I want to do, then I'll join the church. I'll get through my uh, wild oats years and then I'll join the church. I know young people who have said this to me. Some of them are not in the church yet and they are 66 years old. They sure got, up, got over their, their youthful exuberance. They're still not in the church. As one gets older, it's harder to make the changes. And as one gets older, the risk of death comes closer and closer and closer. And it would be horrible to think that you won't be saved because you didn't make the decision when you were young. No, that is not a good excuse. The rich farmer did very well. Jesus told the story. He had an ex excellent crop. Perhaps he had seven years of good like they had in Egypt. And he was determined that he would never be short of food again. He would have food to sell, in fact, if there was a recession. And so he built up his farming kingdom and he built new barns. When the barns were constructed, he looked at them with pride, started filling them with grain, and no doubt if he was that wealthy, he had plenty of servants to do the work. Someone told me the other day he was thrilled to be able to sit down and watch for the first time in his life someone else doing the work for him. So I guess this farmer sat there <coughs> on his uh, deck chair with his cool drink beside him and he watched them carting these great bags of grain and stacking them into his barn. What else, else he had in the barn we don't know. But that night, maybe the exercise would have done him good, but that night Apparently he had a heart attack and he died and that was it. The rich farmer syndrome is one of the problems that keep people from joining the church. When I've done all the things I want to do, 
when I've made my wealth, when I've made my name for myself, when I'm popular, when all these things that so appeal to us in our carnal nature are done, then I will join the church. But sometimes it doesn't happen. Jesus had someone come to him. We call him the rich young ruler. Jesus said to him, come and follow me. You've got plenty of stuff. Get rid of it. Come and follow me and join the church. This is the start of the church. I can imagine Jesus saying, see these guys here, these fellows here, these uh, 10 or 8 or however many there was at that time, maybe the whole 12 were there, said, come and be part of them. And the rich young ruler, as we know him, slowly shook his head. You don't shake your head sideways, do you? You shake your head that way. So he turned his head side to side, and by turning his head side to side, he indicated he turned down the invitation to something which would have given him far more satisfaction than the fleeting pleasures of wealth. And number 10, when I see the signs of the end of the world and it's imminent that Jesus, is, that Jesus coming is imminent, then I will join the church. When I see the signs, then I'll join the church. You know what the problem is with this excuse? The problem is you might misinterpret them. The problem is that you've been outside of the church for so long that you've lost your sense of perspective. Should I use the word you? Such people have lost the sense of perspective and they don't recognise the signs for what they are. And the signs pass them by and Jesus can come and they say, we never knew that was going to happen that way. We were always thinking of something else happening, something that would shake us to the core and we'd wake up all of a sudden. Can you remember when they first set off the atomic bomb on the Muro Atoll? We were driving home. Um, my friend was driving ahead of me by about an hour or so from work and uh, I was driving home from a different place and the sky lit up with this brilliant light. Uh, we were driving along the uh, Rangataiki Plains down near Wakatani. And the sky lit up with this brilliant light and some great uh, beams of light shot up into the air. They'd let off this bomb, atomic bomb. Moro Atoll was a test. The French were trying these things out over there and uh, risking other people's health instead of their own. And uh, <clears throat> my friend stopped on the side of the road hadn't been to church for years, lived a life of however he liked and whatever, and he st uh, got out of his car uh, and uh, he, he trembled in terror because he believed it was the end of the world. You see, although he was brought up in the faith that taught him very clearly what to expect as we approach the end of the world, a lot of it had been forgotten, and uh, he was in terror. I got home, I boarded, or I had a flat next door to him, and uh, he, he came in and talked about it, and he was in terror. He said, is this the end of the world? And we turned on the radio, and of course the radio was telling us all about the atomic bomb that had gone off. I said, no, no, it's not the end of the world. And uh, he said, that's good, he said, I don't have to straighten myself up just yet. You see, people lose their perspective and they don't realise what the signs are telling them. Well, there's my ten, list of 10 main excuses. Good excuses, 10 good excuses. You make your judgement. If you think I'm wrong when I say 10 good excuses, tell me what I should say. Somebody said bad. Well, I'm into that. 10 bad excuses. You see, the church is the place where God puts his jewels. And his jewels are people. And his people are going to be with him. And they're going to be with him throughout eternity. And if his people are not in the church, where are they? If they're not in his jewel box, where are they? And so I appeal to you today, if you haven't made your decision to join the church that God set up, the church that Jesus set up, to join the church with the a philosophy of heaven. If you haven't joined the church that Jesus wants you to join, then you should be thinking seriously about where you are at. And if you are thinking of disjoining the church, 
of moving out of the church, give some serious thought as to where you're going to be. If you're not in the place where God's jewels are, where are you? Are you still in some stony creek somewhere with people tramping over the top of you? Nobody knows you, nobody recognizes you, nobody sees anything good in you really. Everybody wanting to use you for a doorstop or something. I suggest to you today that you honor God's church. And if this is the last sermon that I preach in this church, then I trust <coughs> that I will see you all in the kingdom. Because Jesus wants to take us to a feast. You want not just a feast where there's great big grapes and where there's huge plums and where there's the juiciest peaches in all eternity. Not just that. He wants to take you to a feast, a feast of life that is abundant, a feast which is not just food, but a feast which is a life of comfort, a life of peace, a life of enjoyment, a life free of fear, a life of security, a life of eternity, a life of health, and all those other good accolades that we could make for that. Jesus wants us to be in the feast, and he invites us to be part of his feast. So I challenge you today to make your decision, renew your decision, to be in the feast in the kingdom when Jesus comes. So we're going to sing a hymn, Standing on the Promises of God, because it is the promise of Jesus himself. He said, it is my good will to give you the kingdom. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can look to you still for our salvation, that you will give us uh, the greatest joy when we join your church and when we aim to uh, put aside our own uh, self-centered decisions and to serve you. We pray that as we leave this place today, we'll have the assurance that you'll be with us in whatever circumstances we might find ourselves in life, we pray that you will be with every member of this congregation. Guide them and lead them in your pathways. We pray they'll always have an enthusiasm for your cause 
and enthusiasm for a place in your kingdom because you, the Saviour, is there. So dismiss us with this assurance and with your blessings, we ask please in Jesus' name. Amen.